the story of Otto Hermann Kahn, organizer and reorganizer of our national railroad system, artist, musician, banker, and philanthropist. He was born in Mannheim, Germany, February 21st, 1857, son of a prosperous banker whose home was the center of the financial, cultural, and artistic life of the city. This home life developed and blended in Otto H. Kahn, his two-sided genius, finance and music. It stood him in good stead in the practical work of reorganizing the Union Pacific, as well as in the practical and artistic reorganization of the Metropolitan Opera House. Young Otto has just graduated from the high school of Mannheim. He is in his own room and tranced in his favorite occupation. Thank you, Father. My boy, I have come for a talk. Talk? Why, of course, Father. Otto, you are no longer a schoolboy. It is time to give thought to your life work. You have thought of it, yeah? Oh, certainly, sir. Music, the violin, the cello, that oh, is my... Oh, nein, life. Otto. That is all very well, but as a man's life work, man, I have other plans. You must succeed me in my bank. But my music, Oh, sir. go ahead with it, but don't let it interfere with your application to business. But music is the language of the angels. Business? Well, how can they make? If you keep music in its place, it will do you no harm but good. It will be exercise and practice for your imagination. Don't ever let your imagination get rusty, Otto. You will need it in business. You are asking me to surrender my ambition? But I so carefully planned it all. The concert stage, conduct an orchestra, then compose. Ah, and... In life, we must bend as the wind blows, Otto. Oh, not always, sir. Sometimes one, one must fight the wind. When the wind blows your way, Otto, that would be foolish. Must I answer now, sir? Will you let me think, Father? Why, of course, my boy, but uh, you will not disappoint me, Otto. Hmm? Well, let me think, sir. Let me play for a while. I'm sure my answer will be for the best. Young Otto followed his father's advice and, to serve his apprenticeship, was placed in a bank at Karlsruhe, Germany. His natural ability rapidly raised him above his comrades. Then his progress was interrupted by the call to the colors which every German youth must obey. He fulfilled his military duty in the army, serving with the Hussars for one year. On the completion of his military duties, the Deutsche Bank, recognizing his talents, sent him to its London office. Here, after some time, he met the American financier Spire. So impressed was Mr. Spire with his ability that he offered him a position of responsibility with Fire and Company's branch in New York. Mr. Kahn arrived in New York in 1893. He intended to remain only temporarily, but finding everything satisfactory, he stayed and married, in 1896, Addie Wolf, daughter of one of the early upbuilders of Kuhn Loeb and Company, a worldwide financial power headed by Jacob H. Schiff. On January 1st, 1897, he joined that firm. It was just at this time that Mr. Schiff needed relief from the strenuous work of representing Harriman in his financial battle with Jay Gould over the affairs of the Union Pacific Railroad. Mr. Harriman, the work is getting too much for a man of my years. It needs stronger strength. I must rest. The reorganization of the Union Pacific needs a younger man. Oh, but Mr. Schiff, where can we find someone to take your place? I did not want to displace either you or your firm, and certainly not both. That would not be necessary. Uh, have you met our new partner, Otto Kahn? Yes, and he has impressed me, of course. Uh, let me send for him. Ask Mr. Kahn to come in here, please. Uh, you were saying, Mr. Harriman, but I can't afford to displace both you and your firm. Ah, Mr. Kahn. Uh, <coughs> you uh, you know each other, gentlemen? Good morning, Mr. Mr. Kahn, with Mr. Harriman's consent, uh, I am retiring from active charge of the Union Pacific Reorganization. Uh, it is in its initial stage. The reorganization of the Union Pacific? Greatest reorganization in the history of railroads. And the most difficult. Uh, will you undertake it, Mr. Khan? You will have complete control. Undertake it? Why, of course, I'd like nothing better. Well, all we have is a broken down property, a few streaks of rail. Ah, oh, and that must be worked into a transportation system to serve the country. Ah, yes. And incidentally, to rehabilitate the owners. <laughs> It is a species of work which fascinates me. Of course I undertake. Well, I, I leave you then. Good day. Mm, good day, sir. Although, Mr. Harriman, I, I have had no active interest in the Union Pacific matter up to now, I have kept abreast of it, and I'm well-defined ideas on the subject. There's something 
something I want to discuss with you. It's very personal, but... Well, don't hesitate. We must be frank. That's it. We must be frank. The lack of frankness has caused the public to be against you, sir. And that is why Jay Gould's interests are now successfully opposing. Well, what has the public to do with it? Everything. A nation's railroads are essential to the enlargement of the country's prosperity and efficiency, agriculturally as well as industrially. It is the public's money which supports the transportation system. Publicity will not hurt finance. It will make you public, your friend. I never saw the subject in that light. Perhaps you're right. Go ahead with that policy. Smash the Gould interests. They stand in the way. No, Mr. Harriman. There will be no smashing. Mismanagement cannot be cured by destruction. We use conciliation. But if we are not met, then we will use pressure. Otto Kahn at the helm, there was no smashing. There was a successful reorganization of the Union Pacific, and then of the Missouri Pacific, Baltimore and Ohio, Chicago and eastern Illinois, and the Texas and Pacific. Kahn, at the age of 30, was the consultant physician for sick, big business. But powerful, selfish financial interests were working against him. They were not actuated by constructive ideals. All that interested them was market rigging, speculations, Quick profits was their watchword, even though thousands of innocents were ruined. Khan, I do not like this nervous condition of the stock market. Uh, it looks threatening to me. I'm watching it closely, Mr. Uh, the condition may at any moment result in a breakdown on the exchange. Well, the situation is grave, but I am prepared. Oh, Khan. Huh? Khan. They're going crazy on the exchange. It looks like certain disaster. Why this panic? Why should... Sit down, Mr. Harriman. Calm yourself. I've already taken the necessary steps to restore confidence. The condition is artificial. Artificial? What do you mean? Yes, yes, explain. Well, you know the Pearson Farquhar Syndicate. They are wild speculators that have made daring and very thoughtless attempts to combine existing railroads into a continental system. They are backed by powerful interests, but they overextended themselves. With very oh, how can that... you be so calm in the face of ruin? No, ruin. No, the country is sound. A few selfish interests cannot ruin this country. My confidence is such that I have just completed negotiations for the opening of the doors of the Paris Exchange to American securities. And the listings are $50 million in Pennsylvania bonds there. Are. What? Why, this is the first time in history that the United States securities on the Paris Exchange... Why worry about this artificial panic? But in the meantime... My brokers have orders to sustain the market. To buy, buy. Do you take the situation out of the hands of selfish incompetence? I tell you, the country is essentially sound. <laughs> Otto Kahn took the situation in hand, and true to his prediction, confidence was soon restored. But, in the strenuous life he led, music, his first love, was not forgotten. He gave his time, his money, and what was still more valuable, his ability to the cause of popularizing music. He made it possible for the everyday citizen to get, at the lowest prices, the best of music. He was a director of the Metropolitan Opera House attended his performances regularly, occupying a seat in the less expensive part of the house, that he might get the reactions of the real music lovers. directors of the Metropolitan Opera House, please come to order. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we face a serious situation. The opera is losing its place in the cultural life of the city. You all heard tonight's performance. Need I say more? What is the remedy? Spend more money. Yes, and more money for another star or two from Europe. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Khan, the trouble is that we have forgotten that the Metropolitan Opera is a business. It must be managed as such. It needs reorganization. 
Like one of your railroads? Exactly. And what is your plan? Well, sir, the opera has forgotten its tradition, and today it's living on its reputation, on the splendor of a few big stars. But a few big stars do not make an operatic organization. Well, what does? Modernize the chorus, the stage settings, the orchestra. Give the younger stars, the younger orchestra conductors, both American and European, a chance. Use business methods. So that opera may be at popular prices and get the backing of the general music-loving public. Develop a taste for music. Yes, sir. Develop a taste for music. Then the opera house will be filled in a great artistic organization, saved and continued. Well, will you I undertake this work, Mr. Khan? Oh, yes. I shall be glad. Ah. Good. Cool. discovered that the roots of his life had gone too deep into American soil ever to be dislodged. He became an American citizen. In him was blended the realism of the organizer and the imagination of the artist. A rare, useful personality was the result. His life was founded on true democracy, which, guided by the star of the ideal and firm in its faith, strives to lead all onward and upward to an even higher plane. Otto Herman Kahn, Captain of Industry.